Hi everyone, um, thank you everyone who's tuned in. Um, my name is Morris Casey. I am a research fellow at Queen's University Belfast. I'm also the associate historian at Epic, the Irish Immigration Museum. So it's great to um, start this uh, set of events that Epic is hosting as part of the Outing the Past LGBTQ Plus History Festival in, um, in Dublin with a number of other partner museums. Our first event um, of today will be a conversation between myself and two members, two founding members of the Irish Lesbian and Gay Organization in New York, Anne McGuire and Paul, uh, Anne McGuire and Paul O'Dwyer. And before I begin our conversation, just to note to everyone um, watching in, if you'd like to ask a question, please just um, place it in the YouTube comments below. And then, um, James, my colleague, will uh, send that to me and then I can pose it to, to Anne and Paul. So with that, uh, welcome to, to Anne and Paul. Thanks for joining us. I um, uh, hope you're both keeping well. Anne's joining us from New York and Paul from Ireland. So I guess, uh, guys, to, to begin, just if you just quickly introduce yourselves and say hello to everyone. And we can start with you. Okay, hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Anne McGuire. I was involved with the Irish Lesbian and Gay Organization from the beginning for about 10 or 11 years. And um, I hope we, we can give you a good roundup of what it was all about and what we did. And um, it's good to see you, Paul and Morris. And I'm Paul O'Dwyer. Uh, good to see you, Anne and Morris, and thank you, uh, everybody else, for joining. Uh, I, Even though I'm in Ireland at the moment, I live in New York, and I was involved in the Irish Lesbian Gay Organization from its inception, probably for five or six years uh, after that. And uh, yeah, I'm glad to be here and looking forward to this. Great. And so I guess to begin, who wants to tackle the question of introducing the Irish Lesbian Gay Organisation, how it came about and uh, and why it became so well known in the 1990s in the broader activist scene in Ireland and in the US. Well, so I, I, I'll kick off here and then um, let Anne pick, uh, kick in, but or pick up the... But so Anne and I had known each other from Ireland and we had both moved to the US on or about the same time and uh, we were friends and uh, we, and maybe you remember the dates of this better than me, but at some point there was a, uh, a meeting organized of people who wanted to found a organization or a group of Irish gays and lesbians who were living in New York um, and we met, we had our first meeting at a Japanese restaurant in Chelsea, actually. Um, and after that, we began to, you know, have more meetings and kind of gradually a, a structure and an organization evolved from there. And different people were involved, like there's Irish people, there's Irish Americans, um, and people who identified as Irish or were just interested in it in any way. Um, and yeah, and then at a certain point, <coughs> we decided to apply to march in the St. Patrick's Day Parade, and then of course things took off from there. Um, and maybe you have more, more specific dates than I do, I think, about that. Well, it's not, yeah. I mean, I think basically there was an ad uh, put into one of the uh, local New York Irish newspapers. It was a pretty new one called The Irish Voice. And uh, a lot of us saw, just saw this ad, you know, basically it was saying their, you know, friends who figured out they were gay and wondered if there were other Irish gay people in the city who wanted to meet. Um, <clears throat> so that's how it started. Um, I mean, I guess if you have more specific questions, Morris, because it happened, everything happened very quickly. We marched, yeah. we formed in April, had our very first meeting. That June, we, after only a few meetings, because it was only once a month, we marched in the, uh, the New York City Gay Pride mm -hmm. Parade. And really, in many ways, it was out of that experience, we thought, 
let's go for the St. Patrick's Day parade because a lot of people were really, really surprised to see a group identifying as being Irish and queer in the gay pride parade. And that kind of set the cogs going and saying, okay, gay community doesn't know about it. About mm -hmm. us, I bet the, the Irish community doesn't have a clue either. And uh, <clears throat> Paul, you mentioned the, you marched in the St. Patrick's Day parade and then it all took off. And I think with that phrase that it all took off, there's a loss that we can kind of um, disentangle from that. I mean, this experience of um, marching amongst other queer people and then being surprised by this nature of Irish identity, what then, I guess for people who may not be familiar with the story, was then the reaction of the, the parade then in New York on St. Patrick's Day and let's say the Irish American community's response. You mean on the day of the actual St. Patrick's Day parade itself or you know, yes, as a response and, and to our application? That when we're thinking of this history as well, um, would it be fair to say that the, the organization initially emerged as a, as a social group? Or was there always a kind of a, a campaign, an activist, um, uh, you know, agenda within the group from the outset? Or was it really with the response on St. Patrick's Day that made the group look about campaigning and campaigning around this idea about Irishness and Irish America and facing off against that and trying to make it more inclusive? Well, I think, I think that the group, I think, and actually one of the conversations we had within the group that I remember was this kind of debate, like, are we a social organization? Are we a political organization? Are we, and, and, you know, it was, um, I think the fact that we were having that debate, you know, said fairly clearly that we are, it was, you know, different things to different people. So there were people who joined who had an, uh, you know, kind of a history in activism and in, um, you know, social justice movements and stuff like that. And then there were people who just wanted to meet other Irish gay people and people who wanted to make friends and people who were just curious about what it was all about. Um, and so it we did, uh, to my recollection, maybe, maybe Anne, um, no, differently, but we didn't ever uh, reach a point of saying we are this type of organization or this is our focus or this is our agenda. We had, you know, it was it was two, it was different things to different people. And then when we, um, you know, the the we kind of became very visible, uh, not as a re not only as a result of marching in the parade, but we became very visible as a result of our application to march in the parade. Um, and which, you know, we, we submitted an application to the parade organizers and they said no. And uh, we filed a complaint with the Human Rights Commission. And then uh, it, it, the media got a hold of the story and it, you know, suddenly became front page headlines. And that, that was well before the parade. Um, and that was really what kind of made us very, very visible um, and got everybody on, on different sides of, of the issue involved and aware of us. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, one thing I would add is I think that the group was, uh, uh, was a very broad stroke about who we were for. We were for everyone basically in the in uh, the city who wanted to join and, and for the most part at the beginning it was Irish immigrants most whom had left Ireland um, for all kinds of reasons but to put it in a little context we formed before decriminalization in Ireland that hadn't even happened yet um, and it was a very very different time both in Ireland and across the United States um, so whether or not the group was political or, or not are or, or set out with that agenda very much depended on who had joined. And it just so happened that a lot of people were interested and did join who had a history of being politically active or activists um, along with everyone else. Mm -hmm. And I think in some ways when people like that are in the group, um, you know, we, I will include myself, and that tend to be far more focused, tend to know 
more of what we actually want out of the group and, and also can attempt to make the group um, as inclusive as possible for everyone else. And then as soon as the St. Patrick's Day Parade issue happened and we were not welcomed and we were um, treated very badly when we marched with um, David Dinkins, the mayor, um, who, who described his um, marching with ILGO um, to marching in Selma, Alabama during the civil rights movement. So that's how bad it was. And that will give um, people some kind of context to what the experience was like. And deciding that we were actually going to fight the organizers of the parade was a political decision. And the whole group made that, including people who are not out of the closet, who had never been activists before. The, the group did decide to take that on and deal with the consequences, both here and back home in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised by the, the level of vitriol and hatred that was shown in the parade? Or, or did you have a sense that this there was something blamed within Irish America and the community um, that, that was kind of waiting to come out or, or was evident in any case elsewhere? Well, so, so my thoughts about that were, uh, so first of all, when, when we started to, <clears throat> when we filed our application to join and we had meetings with the organizers of the St. Patrick's Day Parade or with some of them, uh, for me at least, it was like stepping into a time warp. Um, so these were people, predominantly Irish, like older Irish immigrants to the U.S., um, uh, who had been, you know, organizing the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York for years, and but who were rooted in some sort of, you know, time warp from Ireland in the 1940s, um, and who were, you know, shocked by the idea. Well, they were horrified by the idea of you know, gay men, they were, I mean, lesbians, I'm not sure that they even, you know, knew up to that point that lesbians existed. Uh, they were, I mean, they were, they were just, it was a, an environment and uh, just kind of like a whole, um, yeah, it was just a whole environment that I was shocked to discover existed. I mean, I, I had never in my life, <clears throat> growing up, even growing up in Ireland, I'd never come across people or situations who were as regressive and repressive and living uh, very ironically who had you know they had come to Ireland and they lived here in you know the New York metropolitan area but nonetheless who lived in this complete bubble of um, you know what they perceived as like past historical Ireland um, and so that kind of maybe should have set us up for what happened on the, on the day of the parade, but it didn't. And I don't think anything could really have set you up for that level of just complete hatred uh, that was exhibited by people. And um, I mean, this is something that we, you know, I, I, I mentioned earlier in our, our, our talk, you know, discussions about what we wanted to talk about today. So I was, you know, I recently watched a movie about, um, a you know gay pride parade that took place um in a city in um the Balkan countries in the early uh, i think in 2001 and where the parade goers were attacked by far-right nationalists and you know it showed this footage of that and all that happening and i was wondering well, that's kind of what, what happened to us yeah. um and so it was, I mean, I think it took, it took many years to kind of process it, that this, you know, community of people who came out to watch the St. Patrick's Day Parade were actually the equivalent of these, you know, you know very, very far-right, hate-filled groups. Though, of course, they would never think that of themselves, and most people would probably never call them that. But, you know, they had really racist slurs to yell at David Dinkins. They had really, really homophobic slurs to yell at us. There was threats, there was things thrown. Um, it was, yeah, and so nothing uh, could have prepared us for that. 
and 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 I think just to finish up on that, that again having, you know, I mean, I grew up in Ireland in the seventies and eighties, and and this was nothing I had ever ever, you know, not just not been exposed to, but never thought that in a million years that you could possibly ex be exposed to, you know, in Ireland, much less walking down Fifth Avenue in New York. Mm -hmm. And in I guess considering kind of a. Um, the opposite of that, did you find any surprising allies? Was there support from quarters or, or generations that you didn't expect to have around and in response to that first march? Um, I think within the Irish community, an absolute no. I mean, we were completely abandoned by the Irish American community here, completely and utterly. And that is actually, uh, what I find most unforgivable of anyone in a position of power here. You know, there were a couple of people, there was Paul's namesake, Paul O'Dwyer, who mm. had actually been um, Mayor David Dinkins. He, he had um, basically taken him under his arm in the Democratic Party in New York City and showed him the rope. So he was a good guy, but the next generation, his son uh, and people like that, who would have been closer to our generation, the power brokers of Irish America in New York were uh, despicable around this. However, what was very interesting is New Yorkers in general were appalled by what had happened. And in general, I think um, uh, New Yorkers totally supported us, thought this was completely nuts um, in many senses. And the other thing I found extremely interesting because um, it was pre-decriminalization in Ireland, Irish people in Ireland, um, I heard from lots of people about their mothers and their grannies and their fathers were appalled by how their children in America were being treated. So it, it became that kind of, you know, familial feeling of the mm -hmm. Irish in Ireland wanting to protect their children that had, that had emigrated and being appalled by how we were being treated. Mm -hmm. The Irish in New York, wanting to have absolutely nothing to do with us, which carried out throughout the entire um, several of the first years when we needed, when we needed that voice, um, they totally abandoned us. To New Yorkers in general and New York City politicians wouldn't touch the parade with a 10 foot barge pole. Um, so, you know, it was uh, interesting how, how that shook out. Uh, and then of course, um, Paul, maybe you can address this, is the support in the gay community and how we were, how we were viewed or, or seen in the gay community in, in New York. So, um, so within the, the community, within our community, the LGBT, LGBT community in New York, we were, you know, people were completely on our side. Um, there were, there were some disagreements between us and the wider community with regard to legal strategies and disagreements about like, you know, First Amendment stuff and, you know, people who organize a parade have the right to limit the, you know, the parade participants to who they want and it's a free speech thing and all that kind of stuff. So, um, which is very annoying, uh, but uh, overall we had pretty unqualified support from the community when it came to um, people speaking out on our behalf. And most importantly, when it came to people really just kind of going out on the street and putting their bodies on the line and sitting in traffic, uh, risking arrest, being arrested, going to court, um, you know, fighting cases in court, all of that um, was, you know, there was, there was a sense at that point uh, that if, if we had to choose, uh, between which community we belong to or which community accepted us. It was very, very clear that it was the LGBT community that accepted us and not the Irish community. And while there, there were individual Irish people here and there 
who, you know, came out and supported us. Um, those were, people did that on an individual basis, but there was, as Anne said, there was absolutely no zero, nada, zilch institutional support for us from the Irish community. <clears throat> and as time went by, when there was voices of support for us, they were qualified voices of support. They were saying, well, we support them, but, you know, we support them, but we don't want them saying bad things about the church. We don't want them insulting police officers. We don't want them blah, 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 blah. So, um, yeah, so, so we, our, our support came from the progressive political movement in the city and the LGBT community, which, of course, which overlapped. Mm -hmm. And sticking with that, that um, theme, I wonder what you felt when you spoke to other activists who were getting involved with your campaign, who weren't Irish, who weren't even Irish American, what was the sense of the general motivation? Why did they feel that this cause mattered to them? I mean, I mean, from as, as I understood it, I mean, I, I don't think people, I don't think it was a thing that people had to articulate. Like, mm -hmm. oh, this is, you know, I mean, okay, so there's a, parade of there's no you know parade of a group of gay Irish people who are being you know people are threatening to kill them because they want to walk down you know the street in the St. Patrick's Day parade so I don't think that they had to sit down and kind of think out you know a uh like formulate a reason why they wanted to come out and support us I mean it was our, our struggle was their struggle um in that sense um and in in the same way as you know we had been involved in you know struggles of, of you know the fights for the rights of gay people in other situations and environments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think it was a, it was a pretty clear situation and it was highly visible. And that certainly helped us a great deal that it was such a visible story. Every St. Patrick's Day as it came up, it was central. So, you know, the organizers of the parade were really strategically stupid. Mm -hmm. um, they should have just let us in, everything would have been over. Instead, it became, St. Patrick's Day became synonymous with uh, queer liberation. And, you know, mm -hmm. that was their doing as much as it was <laughs> ours. And um, I, I think we, Paul had been um, quite involved with ACT UP and several of us were involved in other groups in the city. And while this happened, um, my partner Marie and myself um, were involved in founding the Lesbian Avengers. So, you know, we knew a lot of people in the city already and, you know, discussed, needed to talk through a lot of um, what was going on and, um, and with people who were more familiar with New York, I mean, in some ways, maybe the, the shock that Paul described about marching in, in the parade and <clears throat> the response was really uh, very, very shocking to us. We hadn't grown up here. Perhaps had we, we would have we would have been a little bit more prepared. And in the same vein, um, you know, I certainly didn't understand completely the absolute power of the archdiocese under Cardinal O'Connor, the way people who grew up here did, or people who were active across, you know, um, feminist and gay and, uh, and other, um, political battles here. So we really needed to bring those people in to understand completely and to be more, to be effective, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it was, um, we didn't really have to ask. It was such a, such a huge issue here in, in the 1990s in the city. It was kind of obvious for, for activists who, who mm -hmm. wanted to do stuff to be involved. I also think it was very, to, you know, so I think context is important and New York in, at that time was a really fertile ground for, you know, for LGBT activism. Uh, there was ACT UP 
there was the Lesbian Avengers, and then uh, Queer Nation started on around the same time. There was a, and I think this may have happened afterwards, uh, but after the after the uh, the whole parade thing happened, but it was on around the same time. There was this group called the Pink Panthers, who were a uh, they would kind of patrol the streets dressed in like I don't know like pink hats and stuff like that as a support like to protect people from being gay bashed and as a response to a series of high profile gay bashings. Um, there was the subsequently then there there was the women's action coalition started. Uh, there were so there was like a lot of activism going on at that time. And so I think so the, the obvious and the natural thing for these groups to do was to kind of stand in solidarity for us. And of course, the natural thing, at least for me anyway, was, I mean, this, this type of environment was where I, I mean, I didn't really sit down and strategize them. I mean, for me, this was kind of like my, this was like home territory mm -hmm. for me. And this was the environment I belong. And these were the groups that I belonged to. Uh, so it wasn't, for me, it wasn't, it was, I didn't see myself straddling a divide between like the two. And I don't think people in those organizations saw themselves as straddling a divide either. And I also think that most of those organizations were, uh, and people for the most part were, were respectful of saying, well, this is your battle. And so we're going to stand with you. Blah, 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 but we don't want to take it over. So this mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. your thing. Like you guys, you're, you're the voice. You speak about it. You set the agenda. We're, you know, we're, we're supporting you, whatever it is that you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and if they weren't, they got an earful pretty quickly. I mean, we were very yeah. clear about, mm -hmm. um, I mean, and we said this over and over, the fact that we were Irish and queer was, there was, you know, we couldn't take one from the other. So we were definitely um, in charge of, of what we wanted and um, and got the support for it. Uh, and it was rare, on rare occasions, people mm -hmm. tried to come in and say, this is what you need to do. We're like, mm -hmm. yeah, we're, we're fine. Thank you. <laughs> hmm? um, <clears throat> and I also want well, to remind everyone watching in as well, do drop in questions and we can weave them into the conversation throughout. And I also wanted to ask, you know, both of you had experience of, of related forms of, of activism and advocacy in Ireland. What, how did you compare those two experiences? I mean, you spoke there about 90s New York being this real landscape of all these various activist groups. Did Ireland feel similar? Did it feel like um, relative to the two populations, there was a, a similar energy, a similar um, kind of activist landscape in both Ireland and in New York. Okay, I'll step in and take this one. I, I had massive culture shock when I hit New York and, and the first group I did go to was ACT UP. And ACT UP had weekly meetings where hundreds hundreds of people attended. And my experience of a meeting like that was an annual conference, maybe. Um, so the culture shock was uh, intense. And also, um, I had not, uh, I thought I was fairly um, comfortable um, being a lesbian uh, and being an activist around that, but I realized I had a lot of internalized homophobia and I wasn't, uh, I wasn't on the same level as, as, the, as the people I was seeing at ACT UP at all. So that was something I needed to take on and think about. But I think when it comes to the nitty gritty of just organizing and doing stuff, I didn't see a massive difference. When you get into those small little huddles of people that you know, you're planning, you're organizing, you want to get something done. In those terms, I think it's very similar. Even the same uh, conflicts come up, um, the same arguments, the, the uh, same tactics, depending on the time you're in and what's going on where you are. I think that kind of work is very similar. Um, and I felt like, I know a lot of other people in Iowa at the time, I felt like I had come 
from a hotbed of activism in Ireland when I moved to New York. Um, uh, I felt like uh, there was a lot going on in Ireland at the time. I mean, there had been the anti-amendment campaign. Um, there was the Eileen Flynn case. There was women in prison in Arma jail, those campaigns. And before all that, there was the hunger strike and the dirty protest. And um, it felt like a hotbed of activism to me. So when I came here, it was about finding where, where, where to go with that. But Paul, you may have had a different experience. I mean, so, so I didn't find this. So I think it was different in a sense that people in the US, I think, express themselves differently. Um, so, and particularly, you know, when I got involved in ACT UP, I, I kind of felt like, well, this obviously, of course, this is, a, this is a wonderful organization and it kind of like, you know, kind of speaks very clearly to things that I, you know, want to be involved in and believe in and all that kind of stuff. Um, what what I, I suppose was kind of surprising for me and or it took some getting used to was the, you know, like the political stuff I've been involved in in political activism in Ireland before I went there was probably, you know, people were much more sort of, um, what's the word? Um, well, people were very into the nitty gritty and people were very into the ideologies um, and stuff like that. And then you got to act up and people were, you know, they were all really young. They were really, not all, but they were mostly young very good looking, summertime didn't wear a whole lot of clothes, very sexy. They were all about pictures and images and graphics and how to convey your message in a different way. And, you know, um, and so that was very different. <laughs> um, and something I wasn't used to, but of course I got used to it and, and became part of it. Um, and so, but as Anne says, like when you, like the, the, the work that you do and the way you do the work, which is you kind of like sitting down and strategizing and organizing and, and working with small groups of people and reaching decisions in particular ways and how you do that, that was not, you know, was not radically different. And, and you know, and of course you, as happens, as you realize you get older, that you come across the same types of people. Um, where you go with the same types of issues and the same types of ways of being and 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 you also have your own way of being and doing things and so that doesn't I think you know you you give some of yourself to the people that you're you're working with and you take some of them away with you so in that sense I think we both go but there wasn't there wasn't something like oh my god this is I've never seen you know there wasn't a mm -hmm. sudden mm -hmm. like culture shock for me mm -hmm. It's interesting, yeah, there's so much, um, there's kind of so many different ways you can kind of tackle the question because on one level, there's a sort of almost Irish exceptionalism that we think we're uniquely prone to splits and arguments and so on, but that's the case in any organization. But equally, there are differences. I don't think I've ever seen someone use the adjective sexy for a group of protesters in Ireland, for example, but it seems the case in Act Up in New York. Um, I, there's a, Question for the audience as well, which I will bring in now from Atlas O'Hare, who asks, I'm really interested in hearing about the attitude towards transgender people at that time, including within um, ILGO, as even a lot of uh, gay and lesbian organizations back then were unsupportive of trans people. Um, I, you know, I, ILGO was kind of a, a, a mishmash of everything and I, what happened um, where there was a little bit of conflict was around bisexual and why we hadn't included bisexual in, in our um, group's name. But we did have trans activists in the group. And um, I would say that, uh, you know, the main group was totally open and totally welcoming. Um, it wasn't, you know, trans liberation was not an issue um, for us back in the early 1990s, the, the way it would be now, if we were forming now, if we would have a totally different organization. But um, yeah, I, you know, I think um, 
it, it, it didn't come up a huge amount. But, you know, I think um, we had one of our arrest situations. This is where the greater New York also comes into play. Um, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson got arrested with us one year. And we were very cognizant of taking care of our people. Um, so in an arrest situation, um, we would never, for example, you would never let one man get arrested on his own. Somebody else would always step in or a minor because we did have minors who showed up and because they get separated out in jail. So the same would have been for trans people, people of color, which there are Irish you know, people of Irish um, heritage that are also people of colour. Um, so we were very, very aware and on top of all that stuff. So we always made sure to take care of people around those issues. But um, I'll go, um, no doubt, if it was organised in the last five or ten years would be different and would have a different name. But we were coming from a place of mostly Irish immigrants in the in the 19 early 1990s in New York so I hope that answers the question a little bit yeah I, I think we so we did have I mean there were uh, trans members of ILGO um, I think that I wouldn't say that we were I definitely wouldn't say that we were exclusionary um, I think that we trans visibility was was not uh, a priority for us at the time, um, as which I, I, I would say was true for pretty much almost all LGBT organizations at the time, is that trans visit people were, I, organizations were not trans exclusionary, but they were like trans visibility was, was not on the, was not on, on their agenda in the way that, that it rightfully has become since then. Yeah. Um, and if there's any more audience questions as well, uh, please do uh, get them in. I, um, <clears throat> I'm interested as well in looking kind of uh, beyond New York as well. And I know we've spoken before about the experience in Boston, but I guess to give the audience a, a sense of, of what you learned and what you experienced as well in, in other cities in the US. Um, particularly around Irish queer identity and different groups trying to, to form around that and what they faced as well. So there was a, an Irish gay and lesbian group in Boston um, who went through the same kind of roughly the same type of experiences we did by applying to March and St. Patrick's Day Parade and being refused and then, you know, the being, being ordered into it by a judge, uh, which we weren't ordered into it by a judge, but we were, you know, kind of facilitated that one year that we marched. And, uh, you know, the physical response from people on the street in Boston was, you know, even worse, like far worse than it had been in New York. It was, it was physically terrifying. Um, and, but I'm, I, and there was an Irish lesbian and gay organic group that started in San Francisco. Um, but it was not, I mean, I wasn't really, I mean, I think at the start, we were all sort of in touch with one another, but then as time went by, we stopped being in contact. Um, and so I'm not sure what their experiences were. I don't think any of them mirrored what we went through in New York or in Boston. But I, I do want to, it would be remiss of me if I didn't point out that. So for people who are watching, so New York City has five boroughs with Manhattan, Queens, Bronx, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. Um, and Staten Island is traditionally been the most conservative of all the boroughs and uh, LGBT groups still cannot march in the St. Patrick's Day Parade on Staten Island. Um, they, I actually saw video footage of it um, like about two weeks ago where the refuser, the organizers uh, refused to even accept a, a hand delivered application from the from the LGBT group to march in, in their parade um, and it was kind of horrifying to see that that you know fine so this is still happening mm. so that is shocking mm -hmm. um 
I suppose we are, we've got about five minutes left, everyone. So if you do have another question, do you get it in? I suppose I want to ask kind of on a, a question that might bring us toward the conclusion. Um, I guess it's quite a broad question, but a lot of, you know, this history, when it's recorded and when it's written, a lot of it's being read by a younger generation of activists who are interested in terms of finding lineage, but also, I guess, in trying to imbibe some idea of a lesson. What was a kind of a lesson in activism that you both took from your work with Algo and perhaps something that you'd impart if a young activist asked you, what, what tips do you have from this history or advice? And you, you, you go. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in many ways, um, I think to go in many ways, you need to trust your own gut. We had so, several big, big issues um, that, you know, I do remember even huddling with Paul once the group had made a huge decision uh, and we were getting outside pressure and we just had to go into a room on our own uh, and remember why the group had made the decision it had made. So in many ways, I would say, go with your gut, work with everyone who understands what you want to do regardless, bring everyone in, um, uh, have some fun. Um, you have to have a sense of humor around this stuff. You're not always going to agree. I mean, I think this isn't just from this experience. Um, uh, but I think uh, this was one of those flukes. It happened at a time, it happened at a moment, someone put it on the front page of a newspaper. And I think if you find yourself in that situation, go for it because you can make a difference. I think um, it, it was kind of like this was given to us on a plate. Um, we made the decision that we were ready. We were not going back into the closet go for it. If you get a gift like that as an activist, take it. That's great. Paul, any thoughts? Yeah, I would say, I want to echo some of what Anne said. So I think, you know, the, the most important thing is, two, two most important things are, number one, go with your gut. You have to trust yourself. Um, I mean, don't be naive. Uh, listen to other people, listen to what they have to say, listen to people who are older and wiser. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to kind of follow your own gut instincts and do what it is that you think is the right thing to do after thinking things through and also you have to have fun however it is you define that and though of course a lot of what you do in the process of having fun is not fun but you ultimately have to um, if you find yourself forcing yourself into a movement or an organization and stuff like that and and you hate it and you don't like it uh, then no matter how much you believe in the ultimate goal, if it's if it's not pleasant, if it's not your way of doing things, if it's not your thing, then don't do it. Um, and the second thing is that there's many ways of being an activist. There's many ways of, you know, of, of, of fighting for your cause, of pursuing it. Um, and you should do it in the way that works best for you. Not everybody's form of activism works for everybody else. So you have to find your level. And, and you have to stick with it. And then you have to make people work with you at the level that you're comfortable at rather than, than going to somebody else's. But the most important thing is that you have to believe, you know, believe in what it is that you're doing and, and find the level at which you can do it best. And then I, I think my final thing also would be to say, like, don't be naive. And I think in ways we were kind of naive in not realizing what was out there and what was facing us. Um, and and so I think that it's important to, um, yeah, to kind of be realistic about what it is that you're facing up against and um, and what you can hope to achieve from it. Yeah, I think that's a hard one, Paul. I mean, <laughs> we were naive because we were tw in our twenties, and I think don't be afraid of that. I wouldn't. Oh no, no. It. I would say, do not be afraid of that. Just go for it. You're going to learn. Learning the ropes is another really good thing. I feel like I learned the ropes in Ireland. I learned from all these 
women and, and men who had gone ahead to me from all kinds of groups, learned how to be an activist. Learning the ropes is, is a really good, really mm -hmm. good thing if you want to really take on something yourself. Um, well, thank you, Bola. I think that's a kind of a natural point to finish up. Um, I'm sure everyone in the audience has, has learned some ropes in this discussion. So um, just so that everyone know, we're going to take a break now until three, when we have our next talk, which will be Vicky Iglokovsky Broad, um, giving a talk on a hidden archive of letters, love letters between men at the National Archives. So um, last thing is just to thank Anne and Paul very much for your contributions. It was really great to see you both and I hope to see you both again. So thanks, guys. Mark. So feel free to Likewise. just log off as normal. Okay, oh, yeah, thanks. 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 Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Cheers. Bye bye. And I will just um, go off as well until uh, three.